Hello, ma'ams and sirs. This is Ronald Ray, your boy with a cornbread accent. Hopefully everybody had a safe and happy Thanksgiving weekend. Speaking of Thanksgiving weekend, let's talk about Thanksgiving traditions. Turkey, dressing, sweet potato pie, pumpkin pie. Uh, the nap between the Dallas and Detroit football games. What's also a tradition back in the day in professional wrestling was these folks would have shows, especially your uh, regional territories. I believe they all, you know, would have, I think most of all, the uh, territories would have their own kind of big, sh- you know, Thanksgiving show, uh, Thanksgiving weekends. I remember uh, watching the Brad Armstrong Shear interview where he stated that they would have Thanksgiving dinner at the Waffle House, Christmas dinner at the Waffle House. But anyway, back in 1983, Jim Crocker Promotions, uh, along with some creative decisions by Dory Funk Jr., I believe, uh, I think Dusty Rhodes came up with the idea of Starcade, or at least the name of it, and I think he added his two cents. Not sure if he actually started being the main booker. I think he was working into being the uh, the booker for Jim Crocker Promotions at the time. But anyway, they thought they'd have a supercar and they called it Starcade. And today I'm going to be doing some reminiscing about this event entitled Starcade 83, a flare for the, go- for the gold. If you fi- folks like what you see, what you hear, uh, you know what to do. Just give a like, subscribe to this channel. And now let's talk about Starcade 83. And the first match of this show was the Assassins with Paul Jones against Rufus, Rufus R. Jones and Bugsy McGraw. And yes, the Assassins were here, and they were masked, and no, they were not from Mexico. Um, I believe the one playing assassin number two in this event, because Tom Renesso has was gone, retired long before this. I believe this is this is Ray Hercules Hernandez, and of course Jody Hampton was, of course, uh, assassin number one. But it's funny, you know, the, the heels were wearing the masks at the time and the fans were going crazy when Bush McGraw was uh, trying to go for the mask of Assassin number one. And we hear Gordon Sola and Bob Cottle. Uh, probably two, of course, you know, I, if you ever heard any of me uh, talking about the good old days and anything involving Gordon Sully, I'll put him over greatly as probably the greatest play-by-play announcer ever. Uh, Bob Cowell was very good too, uh, especially in those days. You really got to, if you go back to watch the Peacock Network and watch the Mid Atlantic shows from the eighties, you could tell he he was really good. That was definitely his prime right there. And the thing I know now, sometimes I do, I will hear an announcer here and there. We'll talk about a particular wrestler's athletic background if they have any. Uh, but here we they do talk about Bugs McGraw's educational educational and athletic background. Not sure how legit it was. I I need to do my research about that. But here's one thing uh, I didn't realize this until about four or five years ago that uh Rufus R. Jones was the father of the WWF manager Slick. Um and of course, you, we see right here. I mean, if you're watching, please, I, I, <laughs> I'd sit there and say, "Hey, we, look at here. We got this old school heat heat here." Like, if you guys are watching, uh, I have not figured out what kind of uh, footage I can show yet, or show and still try to get monetized. Um, I do need to do some research research about that. Or if, if any of you guys are listening and know. How we can do it? 
please drop me a message. But if you are watching it, you can watch it on the Peacock Network and the uh, WWE section. But anyway, one of the things they did here was, you know, use some old school heat. I like you had a hidden object in your hand. I think the uh, I think Jody didn't exactly see where the cameraman was and kind of opened his hands, realized he really didn't have anything. Um, and of course, if it was, that was done this day and the audience caught it on a big screen, or they'll be shouting, oh, you effed up, oh, you effed up, or blah, blah, blah. Um, another interesting thing here is the referee in this match is Sonny Fargo. Uh, <laughs> this is a story I heard from Jim Cornette. But anyway, during the years, or during the year, he'll be a just a mild manager uh, referee official for Jim Crockett Promotions, but during the Christmas holidays, probably during the, you know Thanksgiving holidays too. Before this, um, he would turn into Roughhouse Fargo, who the Nut House will let him out to go visit and help his brothers Jackie and Don Fargo in the Tennessee Territory. So. <laughs> Yeah, I remember there was no internet back then. Uh, magazines, of course. I don't know how, if they, you know, really uh, gave that much publicity to the Tennessee territories. I, like I said, it's a, little for, a lot before my time. Well, as far as, you know, me watching wrestling intensely. But, uh, but yeah, when they had different territories, you didn't have uh cable and all that good stuff or independent channels to carry you know multiple uh territories you know florida watched florida wrestling georgia watched georgia wrestling uh texas watched depends on where you were in texas if you watched if you're in dallas you got the von erickson uh world class i forgot what it was before that um of course amarillo you got the funk territory but anyway, uh, looks like we had a blind tag here. And the Assassin one wound up, well, rolling up Bugs and McGraw and get the one, two, three. Uh, crowd is not pleased, like, you know, by this, of course, because, you know, the Hills won. Um, of course, Hercules Hernandez, I think, after this, would go to Mid South. Um, Let's see, then um, Assassin 1, I think, was split his time between Georgia. I think he stayed in JCP for a while, turned babyface. Maybe we'll uh, discuss that come Starcade 84. Next year. Um, then Buzzy, I think, went back to Florida. Rufus go uh, would lose the Maryland title, I think, a month later than Head back to Central States. I think he was a bigger star in that area. But anyway, this first match, you know, went to the Assassins. And like I said, you know, technically they really didn't cheat. I don't know if there was a hidden tag. The camera went there. So, um, because they look so much alike, you know. Uh, but yeah, it looks like there was a hidden tag. And, and they just got out smart about it. The assassins and it didn't matter because they were bad guys that's wrong and the next match here we, we had a uh, mark lewin not being the purple haze and kevin sullivan teaming up against scott mcgee and johnny weaver um and like i said let's look, don't look like kevin sullivan and there definitely wasn't doing their uh, army of darkness um, gimmick here. Definitely not the uh, satanic gimmick here. Here, uh, Mark Lewin was calling himself the Purple Haze in Florida, and you know Kevin Soul was all painted up and and whatnot. Uh, Scott McGee. Don't think he was quite a rookie here, but still kind of getting his feet wet at this time. Uh, they're pretty good in the territories, but he will go on to, to the WWF and 
he started out good and he wound up being kind of a lower mid car guy. Uh, and of course, what they would do things in Crockett for years, uh, especially in the when Jim Crockett Sr. owned it, they would have special for the Bayface tag teams, kind of the old grizzled bear. Well, I wouldn't say old, just the grizzled bear, bear or seasoned veteran. That sounds better. Team up with a young guy. Um, and of course, Johnny Weaver had been the mainstay big star in Crockett's for years. Uh, teaming up with an upstart, Scott McGee. Uh, but he got to shine a little bit, show his athleticism in this match. Um, but unfortunately, you know, uh, thanks to a need to Johnny Weaver's shoulder as uh, Kevin Sullivan was holding it and referee was trying to push Scott McGee back. Uh, the heels get the winner here, Mark Lewin and Kevin Sullivan. Uh, Scott, Me- Scott McGee would, you know, go to the other side of the ring and come back in and trying to get some, uh, trying to win at least, you know, somewhat of battle, or at least show them that, hey, you might win a battle but not the war. Uh, Gary Hart, who said, hey, I can control these guys, but wind up pulling the spike out, and they used it on, a little bit on Weaver, but really busted up uh, Scott McGee here. Uh, Angelo Moscow would try to come in and make the rescue, but he would get the spike to the arm, but yeah, they really uh, put a number on, on the young... Uh, Scott McGee here. And if that wasn't enough blood for you, boys and girls, we have Abdullah the Butcher against Carlos Colon next. Um, this match, of course, they build up the uh, Gordon Soli and Bob Cottle, you know, build up that, hey, this match was banned in Puerto Rico. Um, but, uh, and of course, you know, Carlos Clone was a huge star in the World Wrestling Council in Puerto Rico. And Ab- <laughs> Abdullah, he scared me. I mean, look at if you get the good camera view there, you'll see all the scars on his head. I mean, I was so scared of him when I I would look around to make sure he wasn't around when I made made fun of the fact that he needs a, he needs a bra. I mean, I'd seen bigger breasts on. Um, on him that I seen on some females, especially at that young age or when I first seen this. Uh, yeah, those, uh, those scars on Abdullah's head was pretty deep. Uh, I think I still got us. I think I still got that on VHS. Uh, RF video shoot interview with Abdullah bit butcher. And I think they gave him an extra 25, 50 bucks or something like that to put a quarter on his and one of the scars and show him like, able to hold up that quarter it was a uh, pretty sick but kind of funny and like i said we have some blood here uh ideally doing it you know hiding the fork then Carlos cologne would have the fork uh use it but you know turnabouts fair play you know uh then you know the poor referee you know Carlos cologne went for a pin there and Poor referee, uh, you know, ate the results of the of a duel powering powering out, and and poor referee suffered from an elbow from Abdullah, and, and it looks like you know Carlos Colon full of piss and vinegar there, going against Abdullah, but has him down for here, you know, having a figure forward and that you know, uh, Hugo Shop, uh. I forgot his name, uh, Hugo uh, Savanich, I believe is his name. Uh, I think I remember him more as being an announcer, but I guess uh, they have a little legitimacy to the Puerto Rico thing. He came in and being the uh, manager of Abdullah. Looks like a sack full of, I guess it was supposed to be like a sack full of coins or something like that to knock Carlos Cologne out and was able, that helped uh, Abdullah get the, Get the victory in this match, but 
yeah, Abdul will have a very long career. He actually, at one time, owned a restaurant here in in the Georgia area. I think this south of Atlanta. Uh, of course, Carlos Colon, like I said before, was a huge star in Puerto Rico. Um, the World Wrestling Council, console, excuse me. Uh, like I said, what had that show, Superstars Wrestling, They one of the territories that would show was the Puerto Rico territory and and uh, seen a bunch of, you know, bloody matches with him and then him against Abdullah. And, of course, just about every territory, especially Puerto Rico and and world class will have, you know, their fe- one of the featured feuds will be Abdullah against Bruiser Brody. Uh, but, but, yeah, that... Got some more blood in that that one, so that as you can see, uh, <laughs> that ring is uh kind of it's turning a little icky there, ain't it? Now we have Bob Orton Jr. against Chief Wahoo McDaniel and Mark Youngblood. Uh, Bob Orton Jr. Uh, he's the son of Bob Orton Senior. Uh, brother of Barry Orton, who basically wrestled as Barry O most of the time, but didn't have a very long career. Uh, there was some controversy, not nothing that he did, but maybe we'll talk about that some other time. And Dick Slater, supposedly one of the legit badasses in wrestling. Uh, of course, he's no longer with us. Rest in peace, Dick Slater. Uh, and then there's, you know, Wahoo McDaniel. Rest in peace to him, too. But uh, Bob Orton, uh, he had a kid. What's his name? Randy, I think. Yeah, I think Randy did okay for himself. I hate, that's getting, that just getting old, ain't it, guys? I uh, think you hear that joke every, I think everybody says that little line about people. Um, but supposedly, a uh, little inside thing here. Uh, I think it was the Mike Graham shooter interview where he talked about there was a fight between Dick Slater and Bob Morton. Of course, Dick Slater got the best of it, but this is that was way before this. But look how well they get along here. It's almost like it, today somebody supposedly got in a fight in the locker room, and whether they did or not, it come back and hey, do business. Um. But yeah, this is a pretty good man. I, and here's a Wahoo. Uh, guys, seriously, go back and watch some uh, old, you know, pre-1985, heck, even after 1985, 84, whatever, a Wahoo McDaniel. I know people talk about Ric Flair's chops, but let me tell you, if I was one of those enhancement talents back in those days, and I would come in and say, oh, yeah, you're going against Wahoo, I, I'd be dread. I mean, I approached those chops, man. <laughs> I know I was going to be, I'll be eating a lot of those. Uh, suppose there's a, a match uh, with him and somebody else against the Anderson, or Ollie and Arn, or Ollie and Gene Anderson. And Gene Anderson literally ate a chop, kind of bust a couple of teeth out. But, you know, this, this is a good match for, for its day, day and all. Um, uh, Little, uh, of course, you know what the story on this match was. Wahoo trying to get a little revenge, uh, on behalf of Rick Flair because Harley Race had put a twenty-five thousand dollar bounty on his head, and Orton and Slater was thought they collected, uh, but it was all a ruse. Um, but anyway, I mean, in the end here, you got. Bob Orton, who performs a superplex on Mark Youngblood, and it just, it you know, just l- look at Bob Orton work. I mean, so smooth in that ring. I mean, it the apple don't too far fall too far from the tree with Randy Orton and his dad. I mean, but just that superplex with a float over, one two three, and that was it. And you know, Gordon sold it perfectly as, hey, nobody gets up from the superplex. And at the time, nobody did. Um, of 
course, now people do super places off the top rope and they lay there for about 20 seconds and up and fighting again. Um, but of course, you know, the fan, you know, even though they did win fair and square here, uh, somewhat, um, they're definitely not liking that Orton and Slater won. Uh, prior to the finish there, we got to see a little, uh, outside little, little fight with Wahoo and Dick Slater, but, but all in all, it, it served its purpose. And here we have it, a uh, match for the, I think it, this, I'm not sure if they call it the world television title at the time, but definitely the middle at it. Well, yeah, they say the NWA Corners card NWA TV title. Uh, the champion Kabuki putting up a title against uh, Charlie Brown from out of town. His mask. And come on. Uh, you hear him talk and everything, but everybody knows it's Jimmy Valiant. Uh, one of those deals where he lost a loser league town match and he came back in the mask. Even though everybody knew who it was, I'm like, no, 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 it ain't him, blah, blah, blah. You know, fight fire with fire, whatever. Um, but Kabuki, Kabuki was probably. <laughs> I totally dug Kabuki. I thought he was a cool thing, even though he's, you know, most of the time a bad guy, or whatnot. But, um, now I, I do remember watching him on, vaguely on Georgia Championship Wrestling. You know, like I said, a few years before I really started paying attention, and like I said, the hair, the the face paint, the you know, um. Uh, pre-match get up he would have like a mask on stuff like that and of course the green mist that was uh <laughs> that 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 was the uh coolest thing right there you know it's like oh wow how does he you know spray that green mist out of his mouth um and of course you know he, even if he you know used it to spray it in somebody's face you you're like, oh, they shouldn't do that, but it's so cool. Um, of course, years later, uh, the great Muda, Kenji Muda, Mudo, uh, when he started in WCW here, or I think it was like the tail end of W or uh, NWA, Crocker Promotions, and went to uh, uh, WCW, I think around 80, somewhere between 80, like maybe tail end, 88, 89, 90. Um, they call him the Great Muda, and they build him as the son of, you know, uh, the Great Kabuki, and he did the Green Mist, and athletically was above and beyond, you know, Kabuki at the time. Uh, even though Kabuki did, did the karate thing, but this is... <laughs> His karate at that time was very dated, and Kijimudo, or uh, Great Muda, if you watch one of his old matches at that time, they hold up pretty good. You can tell he was kind of a little, little ahead of his time a little bit. Um, but, you know, uh, it, this cool thing here, it's like uh, they, he keeps on working that the claw hold, uh, and yes, Believe it or not, there will be pe there were people at the time would lose to a claw hold, and people would use that as a finisher, like Blackjack Mulligan, uh, Devon Eriks, mainly Fritz in his heyday, Baron Von Rasky. I think the last person to really use it as a finisher, I want to say Barry Wyndham, off the top of my head, when he first became a horseman. But uh, but hey, Jimmy, or excuse me. Charlie Brown from out of town kept fighting through it and wound up hitting a big elbow drop and wound up pinning uh, the great Kabuki here and kept his mask, won the TV title, I believe. Crowd is happy. Uh, Rough House Fargo, you know, didn't go nutty. So, fun time for all, you know, yeah, Jimmy, yeah, I mean, that's far as fun time. I, if you watch Jimmy Val that, those times, he definitely, uh, he was definitely a great entertainer, uh, especially at this point in his career. Now, I know what you guys want. You guys want some more blood. 
And I believe you're going to get here in the Greg Valentine versus Roddy Piper uh, dog collar match. And they say this is the first one. I'm not sure. Uh, something I definitely need, need to research on, but I know in interviews I've seen from both guys, I think they say this, that thing was so uncomfortable, less uncomfortable to wear. Um, uh, trying to guess who the, uh, the corner guys for Grave Valentine. I think that looks like Frank Dusick, but, uh, Kind of a skinnier, well, I mean, I guess this is 83. I think the, the first time I really seen Frank Dusick, uh, may have been 88. So five years of uh, being a, you know, kind of an office guy for Fritz and Watts. Um, my age a little bit. And let's see, yeah, it's Gary Roll and... Frank Dusick for Greg, Greg Valentine. Uh, for Piper. That's definitely Brickhouse Brown. And that could be Vinny Valentino. Uh, another guy I think he done more enhancement thing uh, or enhancement um, work than than really ever gotten a, getting a push or anything. Um, but uh, but yeah, that we like I said, we you know they tell a story about you know the ear of Piper, which was injured from you know Greg Valentine when he you know I think he when he won the title from or the U.S. title at the time from uh Rowdy Roddy Piper. Uh, and of course you see the you know blood from there the head and Valentine you know bleeds a little bit of course I think a year from now uh, they'll definitely won't be doing no more of that because they weren't working for the big they work in New York for the Fed the World Wrestling Federation uh, which you know later, which now is W or World Wrestling Entertainment WWE. Um, let's see. This, I mean, nothing fancy here. It's, uh, we're just taking it and be, beating the heck out of each other with it. You know, fan, fans are pretty receptive here. You know, they were really behind Piper at this time. Uh, he, you know, I hear for a long time. A uh, little history here that, you know, you know, Gordon Sully talks about when Piper was in Atlanta. He was like a color commentator, uh, was a heel. Uh, I think he had fused with Bob Armstrong. Um, then Don Morocco at one time uh, got mad about something and was about to attack Gordon Sully, and Piper uh, stood up for Gordon Sully, and that turned him babyface and... And uh, in Georgia, I'm not sure. I don't think he lasted too long. Uh, Ole fired him from like no show, and uh, according to him, according to Ole Anderson, you know, he showed up one day. It's like, uh, you're gone. Um, due to uh, maybe some uh, something. <laughs> Substance, substance abuse or substance use, but uh, anyway, that's neither here nor there. Uh, man, it definitely, uh, definitely, uh, this not a uh, this beating the heck out of each other, you know, trying to choke each other, rip each other's mouths off with that chain. Um, uh, and of course, this was a you know simple finish and. Didn't need, didn't need to do no, you know, um, any too uh, high risk or fancy or laying on your head too much in these days. Uh, Valentine just went for a simple elbow from the second rope and got pulled down by Piper. And Piper just took that chain, beat him some more, wrapped him up that chain, cradled him, and uh, won, won the match. 
Um, I guess they you know want to extend a few more. That's you know once Greg Valentine got loose, he attacked Piper, and Piper came back for a little bit and said, "Hey, you know this we ain't done yet," you know. And I think they did do a series of dog collar matches uh, around territory, but but that's how they would do it. They you know uh, that kind of a you might win the battle but not the war type. Uh, finishes at the time, which you know was great because you know people got excited, people went and bought tickets or turned turned to uh, went to watch it on TV the next uh, week and and uh, see what might happen. You know, where are they going to wrestle at next? If they're going to wrestle in my hometown, I'm going to buy go go buy a ticket. That's the way things were done back then, boys and girls. And this right here, this is probably the best most technically sounded uh matches of, of this night was Ricky Steamboat and Jay Young Blood going against the Briscoe brothers, uh Mark and Jay. Just kidding. Uh <laughs> Jack and Jerry Briscoe. Um uh, and what's funny here, uh Jay, who of course was uh Wahoo McDaniel's partner, Mark Young you know, Young Blood's brother. I had another brother named Chris also. And if, if I remember correctly, I think they're Latin, they're from Puerto Rico or something, or their dad's from Puerto Rican or Puerto Rico. I think that actually I think they're from some kind of Latin descent, but here they played Indians. And of course, across the ring was a uh, uh legit uh Native Americans. Uh uh, two people who are, you know, like I said, legit uh, from Native American heritage. So there's your uh, little tidbit from the day, or for this match anyway. But yeah, like I said, this is very te- technically sound. Uh, Steamboat, always in great shape. Jay right here, probably one of the best shapes he was in in his career. Uh, Sally, he would pass away, I believe, in... 85. Um, but you know, we got some, you know, baby face, baby face shine, uh, Bri- you know, Briscoe's who are, you know, baby face for a long time, I think. I think this is towards tail end of their careers, too. Um, uh, let's see, here's 83. I think they, uh, will win the world tag team titles again later on. And sorry, I just pulled it. I thought I kind of spoiled it in this match as uh, Steamboat and Jay Youngblood would win their record fifth NWA World Tag Team titles. Um, not the most fancy of, of finishers. You know, he just picked Jay up and slammed him on top of, uh, I believe it was Jerry. Um, and of course, the special I forgot the special referee in this match was Angel Mosco, who, uh, and you know, back then they, you know, in a backstage interview, they did talk to him because he was supposed to, uh, re- be a special referee in this match. It was, if you watch it, it was kind of, it looked bad. <laughs> Uh, here's Angel all taped up, and there's Rip McGraw just laying on the couch, looking half dead, and as Gordon will so say that crimson mask. Um, but he, you know, he vowed he was going to be able to be the special referee in this match. He did a good job. He didn't really um, do, you know, this, you know, the stupid fast count for the baby faces or whatnot. Kept it. Straight down the middle, but like I said, uh, I'm trying to think here, I think it was what 84 where Jack and Jerry sold their stock to or, or sold their stock to Georgia Championship Wrestling to Vince McMahon. Um, uh, they'll both get go to WWF for a brief time. Uh, I think Jack totally retired from the business. Uh, Jerry stayed on as a agent and. 
uh, and a booker for events. Um, and of course, you know, you younger people probably remember Jerry Briscoe and Pat Patterson being the Stooges during the Attitude Era. But yeah, like I said, definitely, definitely a good match here. Little, little, like I said, a little dated little finisher here, finishing move. And yes, that would be a high spot finishing move back in those days, but still, uh, it did pretty good. And of course, they you know can't, will come back and attack Steamboat and Jay. Uh, this, like they did in the last match, would you know create more interest for the rematches and and whatnot. And of course, right here, this is what we all came to see, or what they all came to see. Uh, handsome Holly Race at the time, seven time NWA World Heavyweight Champion, had a long career. Uh, was a big star in AWA. Him and Larry Henning were, I think, tag team champions. More, you know, a couple times maybe. Um, of course, Ric Flair going for, I think that's a third title reign. I got, got, well, I mean, he did win it like 16 times. So, who can keep up who he beat and all that stuff. Not, right now, off the top of my head. I mean, I thought he beat, Dusty once. He might beat Dusty twice. Um, then Harley here once. Or he might beat Harley. He might beat Dusty and Harley each one time. And he stated at, at, at that time, you know, the first two reigns were, or his first reign, he really wasn't ready. Second time, he was ready. But this, this time right here, it was, you know, um, Hey, it, it says in the title it was a flare for a goal. Uh, he won it this third time, and he was, you know, definitely ready to carry it, you know, carry the belt, be the champion, be the, at the time, you know, they had a traveling world champion, and he would go to different territories and wrestle, or, you know, NWA affiliated territories and defend a championship. Um, and they, you know, a lot of people look at this as, you know, the official passing of the torch. Uh, there was a, title change in New England or New Zealand that would give Holly Race uh, an eighth world championship, but uh, it was never acknowledged on TV at any time. It was, wasn't acknowledged till 10, 20 years ago, probably, if that. Um, but, you know, here's Ric Flair being, being a baby face at the time, and everybody came in and celebrated after uh, – he won. It's probably one of the first times a uh, player came off the top rope and hit a move, and it paid off. Well, thanks to, you know, because earlier, you know, Race had butt ahead, literally butt heads with uh, Gene Kaniski there, and it was like Holly kind of tripped over Gene, and that helped uh, Rick Flair get the win here. Uh, again, here's a you know, special referee at deal here uh pretty much he, even here he you know he held harley back which play was able, able to capitalize uh a mo few moments later you know flair was at harley in the corner and can he held flair back and holly uh, uh was able to capitalize but this was and the thing was you know you look at this. I mean, yes, they did use a cage as a weapon. Um, and let me bring this up. Oh my! Look at that camp. I mean, if you had those times, they show like a, a over the ring view. Uh, <laughs> this definitely would not work in these days. Uh, I mean, first you know you got uh, both both guys uh, legitimately uh, bleeding. And I think now they, you know, if they do a match where both uh, people who are wrestling each other bleeding, one of them will use fake, and uh, maybe the other one use fake too. But uh, but man, that that canvas is uh, you got blood and everything on that canvas. Uh, uh yeah, that de definitely wouldn't wouldn't uh wouldn't happen in the day. Uh. They kind of, you know, for the most part, kept it a wrestling match. 
inside of a steel cage. And that's what a lot of people would do back then. They'd keep, keep it a wrestling match in a cage because the cage was basically there to keep other people out. And, of course, um, they will, you know, most all cage matches, they, somebody's going to use that cage to their advantage. Uh, and especially at this time, um, I think even WrestleMania 3 with the, or WrestleMania 2, excuse me, WrestleMania 2 with King Kong Bundy and Hulk Hogan. I think Hulk Hogan uh, bled a little bit, but they really didn't do that in WWF ever, ever, because that time they were family entertainment. But, up, uh, you know, like you see now, you know, hardly anybody bleeds in a in a cage match. But at th- this time, if it's a cage, or most just about any gimmick matches, somebody's going to bleed. Um, and as Gordon so would say, "Hey, his face is a crimson mask." But yeah, this again, a good world time match, good passion of the torch. Uh, like I said, I think this is the third time. I think was what they said. Uh, Ric Flair wound up, you know, winning, losing it 13 more times. Uh, Flair de- definitely in good shape here. And Holly was, you know, he was in this, uh, the down, not the downslide, but the tail end of his career. I think, uh, he might have went to AWA for a little bit. Um, then, I think he's, you know, for whatever reason, I think he has some money. I think he's trying to sue Vince because they were trying to come into Kansas City in which he still owned part of. Uh, but he wound up having to go work for the WWF and became King Harley Race. Dyed his hair blonde. Uh, I think they actually had a King of the Ring turn. This for way for the uh, Bret Hart uh, King of the Ring pay-per-view. Uh, they had another King of the Ring tournament, and Harley Race won it. And he was uh, called the King, King Harley Race. In which Jerry Lawler didn't like. I think he tried to sue whatnot, but that's another story, another day. But yeah, this is a this is definitely Ric Flair's coming out party, and and definitely didn't look back here. He wound up drawing a lot of money for Crockett's. A lot of money is the world champion. Um, and what can you say? This is and the one thing um, they were keen on. Oops, I think I messed up there. Cut off my microphone or muted the microphone accidentally. <clears throat> but after the match, you know, he did do the interview in the ring, then they kept going back and interviewing everybody, uh, you know, say, you know, say, Hey, you know, you know, Holly say, Hey, you know, might have a, I am going to challenge you again and whatnot. And during one of, uh, as you see the people in the, uh, good guys slash baby face locker room, everybody's drinking the champagne and celebrating their buddy, Ric Flair. And you see right here is a you know classic photo. You know you have, you know two legit, you know definitely two. Everybody knows they're legitimate friends. You know, uh, Ricky Steamboat and Ric Flair. Uh, here's there's Steamboat and Jay Youngblood. Their world tag team titles with uh, Flair and his bloody glory. Um, holding up the uh, at the time the original ten pounds of gold. I think they call it the Sweet Charlotte now. And the uh, Billy Corgan ran, run NWA, but yeah, that's that's a classic belt that you know was used for a long time for the big gold belt, gold belt. But um, but you did see, you know, they did give this match a good big fight feel. Uh, they had some not the segments that you see now. This you know uh, backstage a little, you know, they'll interview the all the competitors. They'll talk about their matches a little bit, but then they'll say, hey, what do you feel about this Ric Flair Holly Race match? And they'll give their opinion. I say, giving you that big fight feel, this is, you know, this is for the World Heavyweight Championship. Um, 
So I thought thought they did did a good job there. And Gorn Sully uh, kept alluding to that this is a this this is taking the business to another uh, another level. Actually, this is a uh, and he was right. Um, I think they did the closed circuit here. Uh, basically, had the matches at uh, was it Greensboro here? Um, let me see here. Do, 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 do. I got my notes. Yeah, the Greensboro Coliseum, which drew a uh, corner of this. Uh, 15,447 people uh, sold out to the Raptors. Standing room only, folks. Um, lost my train of thought there. Anyway. But yeah, uh, they they had it here then all across uh, the other arenas. They, you know, used some, however they used it. Uh, definitely would like do research on that. I guess satellites would, you know, connect to these other arenas and uh, you could buy a ticket to, say, like the Omni in Atlanta uh, and on the Charlotte Coliseum and go watch this event on their big screen, uh, which is not like our big screens you see in the in arenas and stadiums now. Uh, yeah, it'll be a little dated. Uh, but this is a precursor to, to the pay-per-views. Uh, this was, they used to call this the granddaddy, granddaddy of the, uh, granddaddy of them all. Uh, and it was, this was the, you know, this pre WrestleMania, this is, uh, a big event. They had wrestlers from other territories come in and kind of, uh, perform. Uh, of course, you know, Gorn Sully wasn't the main, uh, play by play guy in Charlotte and, uh, Jim Cocker Promotions, he he was Georgia, he was Florida. Mm, I where else? Uh, yeah, 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 this was 83, I think, mainly Georgia and Florida at the time. Um, so they got him, to, you know, because he was the best at the time. They want to get this match a big, or this uh, event a bit, a big event feel, and it was. Um, and this event will go on every year uh, till the close. You know, you know, went came went from NWA Jim Crocker Promotions. Ted Turner bought it, then renamed it WCW. They kept that lineage, uh, and it was starcated up until it you know shut down. I think WWF had a couple little starcade events. Uh, but they, I think they record it, maybe put it on their network a couple times. But that's it. Um, as far as the event now, kind of watching it now, I mean, it is dated, but still, you did see some good stuff, some entertaining stuff. And just the fans' response, you know, wouldn't know uh, funny little chants here and there, uh, which some of them are, are good. I'm not totally knocking that. Uh, but hey, you know they they came in they they played along. So like, like I said, I think still at this point, I think most er- everybody should have known. I mean, this did this was before the uh, whole twenty twenty thing. Uh, but I think if you watched it enough, you know it was you know it was a work. But people just it was like a live action show. Basically, you cheered on the heroes, you booed the villains, and all is well. Now it's a now it's a whole lot different. And um, sometimes these uh, creative people need to figure out what how, you know. How can we uh, somewhat get back to that where people are actually emotionally involved and? Or emotionally invested in these competitors instead of no, I want to, you know, everybody needs to be, you know, champion or everybody needs to be this, blah, blah, blah. And actually, um, instead of like the, what the pay per view, the AEW pay per view crowd, crowd was chanting, uh, part of my language, fuck CM Punk. CM Punk wasn't even in the match. Who cares? 
you had the elite against the uh, the death triangle. You know, pay attention to that. But anyway, I digress. Like I said the wrestling was a little dated, but it was still you know pretty solid. Uh, didn't need you know no uh, flips. Everybody sold. Um, and that's basically all I got to say about this. Uh, like I said, a little reminiscing now, just to celebrate the Thanksgiving holidays or the Thanksgiving weekend. Um, like I said, if you guys enjoyed this, leave a like, subscribe, and I hopefully, like I said, everybody had a happy, safe Thanksgiving weekend. Nobody got hurt, any accidents, no tickets. Uh, man, the cops were out bad this weekend. They're all, you know, that's every that's every uh, holiday weekend. But anyway, uh, you guys take it easy, and I'll s- talk to you guys later. We here at RP Tube Vision would like to thank you for tuning in. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. Also check out friends of the show Ecolife and Natural for home-crafted candles, hand cloth, and other home and personal goods. Look them up on Facebook. Link will be available below the video. That is Ecolife and Natural.